Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to all the delegates of this very first section of dermatology webinar uh, coming from the RSM. So since the last uh, clinical cases meeting in February of this year, uh, the programme was cancelled, as you know. But today, we're very excited to be able to be starting this new form of CPD. In this, uh, at, uh, this time, which is uh, the new normal, it is the form of CPD that we're now becoming familiar with. Uh, we're still learning to live with these ever-changing rules, uh, but we have chosen for today a subject that's of relevance and importance to the workforce across the country. Uh, the skin problems related to the increased and prolonged wearing of personal protective equipment and the regular skin cleansing that we're all doing. So I hope that you'll find this of relevance uh, both from a knowledge point of view, but also very practical. I'm very pleased also that we have educational support for this meeting from Beersdorf. Uh, of course, there's no chance to discuss face-to-face -face, uh, the products and the constituents, but at the end of the slides, uh, there will be um, a link, and you'll have a link later on sent to you for the products and the ranges, uh, the range of products that come from Beersdorf. And you will be familiar with these, I think particularly those in the user in range uh, that you probably yourself use in clinical settings. Uh, and I would say that the company has had no input into the subject or content of this meeting. Now, I expect you're all probably fairly familiar with uh, remote working and learning over the web, uh, as you've been doing it yourself, I'm sure, over the last few weeks. But I just want to let you know the, the rules of the game for the webinar from the RSM. So um, as delegates, you remain invisible and muted. I know you're out there. There are over 250 registered earlier on today. Uh, so there are a lot of you there, but we can't, uh, we, nobody can see you. Um, your questions, however, can be submitted. Uh, if you haven't done a webinar before, you'll see at the bottom of your screen uh, that you can choose question and answer, and you can submit your written questions through that. Please also state your name and uh, where, where you work so that we can have an idea uh, and to answer your questions later. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of all the presentations today. Um, and if you want to submit a question and you see somebody else has just submitted it, there's an option to upvote a question. So you can add a thumbs up um, little icon to a question. Uh, and if 10 of you do that, then we'll know that that's a question of great interest to people and it'll sort of come up to the top of the questions to be, to be asked. Um, and all the panel will be available for the live question and answer session at the end. Uh, you'll also be sent a, an email pretty soon after the end of today's webinar asking you for feedback. And with, uh, with the um, messages that you'll receive following this webinar, There'll be some links to Beersdorf, the company sponsoring this meeting, uh, and also uh, the opportunity for you to get a certificate of registration after you submitted your feedback. And then, added bonus, uh, for 30 days after tomorrow afternoon, you'll be able to go back and look at the webinar. So if you miss any of it or get called away to clinical, clinical needs, um, you'll be able to go back and see it all again. So let's get down to business. Very delighted to be able to introduce the speakers from today, the team from the cutaneous allergy unit at the department uh, in Guy's and St. Thomas's. Uh, and in keeping with the usual flavor of learning from real patients at the RSM, we're going to hear about the experiences of the unit in helping those individuals affected by the current protection practices. So over to you, Ian. Right, I think that I'm live, and I'm uh, Ian White. I think most of the participants will probably know me, but I think that we have participants from uh, the Far East, uh, Asia, uh, and the Americas, obviously Europe and Manchester with us uh, 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 today, so, so welcome. Uh, our president mentioned the word cutaneous allergy because we are the department who, who normally does diagnostic patch test investigations, but we deal with patients with occupational uh, dermatoses uh, as, as well. So it's from 
cutaneous allergy. We know most of the, the presentations are nothing to do with allergy per se, but of irritant contact dermatitis uh, and, and so on. Now I'm going to try and do a screen share here, which I hope will work. Uh, there we go, there, share. Good. And I hope that shares now. Um, we have four members of our team today who will be presenting myself, uh, John McFadden, Felicity Ferguson, and Louise Cunningham. And we'll deal with various aspects of the problems we've been seeing in, 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 in sequence. Uh, first of all, I'll be providing a background to the problem as we uh, saw it in, in March. And uh, then John McFadden will be talking about the problems of hand eczema in the COVID ward staff, to be followed by Felicity Ferguson talking about facial dermatoses seen in the COVID ward staff, and then Louise uh, Cunningham uh, discussing the, de the development and use of virtual uh, patch testing undertaken in these very difficult and extreme situ situations where we've either not been able to see patients uh, face to face or, or have uh, had to see them uh, just, just once and not on three occasions. And then finally, finally uh, a summary and lessons uh, before we go on to the questions and answers. Now, as far as a background is concerned uh, here, I'm quite old now, and I recall all the problems that we had in the 1990s with latex protein hypersensitivity caused by the so-called universal precautions introduced because of HIV. And this was the business where we were encouraged to wear uh, gloves before any patient contact, washing our hands and so on and so forth, uh, frequently increased hygiene and avoiding direct skin contact because of the HIV uh, that was, was developing in the 90s. And many of you will know about the problem of latex protein hypersensitivity that developed at that time where many people, many people, particularly nurses and other frontline healthcare workers developed immediate uh, type one hypersensitivity to latex proteins acquired from using uh, I'm going to use the word low quality gloves. So it was a quality issue. They were low quality gloves. And then we we're reminded of that, of, this, of the control of, uh, control of substances hazardous to health or the COSH regulations in the United uh, Kingdom, which were introduced in 1994. And that, that says that uh, every, every uh, em employer uh, must, must ensure that exposure to a, a substance hazardous to health is either prevented, in other words, shouldn't occur, or, or when that's not possible, uh, it's not reasonably practical, should be adequately controlled. And people forget about this. In the healthcare setting, we're always quite correctly concerned about patient safety and patient's health. But the, our employers, their overriding responsibility is to the health and safety of the employee, and that is often uh, forgotten. So with that in mind, when uh, in, in, it was the 4th of March uh, this year, this was the, the, the government advice, the first government advice that, the, that was, uh, came out in the United Kingdom, Washing hands for 20 seconds is central to the expanded public awareness campaign to prevent and slow the spread of coronavirus. And you remember the pictures of the, the Prime Minister washing his hands and singing happy birthday uh, and so on. So it was washing the hands. Washing the hands was central to the public health campaign. Now, of course, washing the hands, we'll know as dermatologists, if you're washing your hands excessively and frequently, there's the tendency to develop an irritant hand eczema, as we, as we know. Well, because the, the, we, the, the COVID problem started in the, in the UK just, a, f just a, a few weeks after uh, China uh, uh, and uh, shortly after uh, uh, Northern Italy. And we were aware from uh, talking to colleagues in various parts of the world where the, the COVID epidemic 
or pandemic had hit them slightly earlier, that they were seeing, in many ways, the predicted problems in the staff with the, with the hand eczema, irritant hand eczema, and with wearing the, uh, the, the, the respirators as well, the so-called FFP3 uh, respirators, which for Felicity will talk about uh, shortly. So with that background information, that we've had problems in the past when uh, there's been an increase uh, in exposure to, to hygiene precautions and protective uh, PPE. Uh, and with knowing what was going on elsewhere in the, in, in the world, we knew that we were going to have a problem. So in the week between the 28th of March and the 6th of April, uh, our department arranged at GSTT, that's Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital, for the general provision of a range of moisturisers to be distributed to the frontline staff. That's all the people on these COVID wards and elsewhere who are now being encouraged with all these, these new hygiene precautions, lots and lots of moisturisers. Uh, uh, and it's whatever we had in the pharmacy in, in quantities. We weren't interested in little samples. We needed you know, bulk orders of these things. What did we have and what quantities we, did we have, both in, in dispensers and also in little samples so people could have in, the, in their pockets to be given to the front line. We also uh, agreed with, with our trust board that those members of staff with occupationally induced aggravated skin conditions should be exempt from prescription charges. I know there's no prescription charges in Wales, but there certainly is in England. And it would be rather silly uh, to, to be prescribing uh, a moisturiser or a topical steroid to our staff who developed a problem because of their work at the hospital. Uh, and it was realised that this was nonsense and th 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 so th that they got exemption from prescription charges. And the other thing that we did is that our pharmacy uh, arranged for a variety of steroids and moisturisers, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk in a few minutes about the list that we had, so we deposited in our clinic so that when we saw patients, we could hand them out to, the, to our patients to our frontline staff experiencing problems so they didn't have to go to the pharmacy and queue up. So that's what we did in that week. And in the same week, also, we devised information, wrote information sheets for staff on the prevention of irritant contact dermatitis. And we'll talk about that again uh, shortly. They were distributed widely onto the frontline areas and also published on the intranet. Additionally, we set up uh, dedicated virtual dermatology clinics for the frontline staff. Three of these a week, uh, virtual clinics, in other words, telephone calls, they, they could book themselves in online and they could also pop down to our clinics if needed for face-to-face for -face consultations if required. Also, and Felicity will talk about this, we had outreach or pop-up dermatology clinics in the COVID ward areas. So as well as patients, our staff coming down to see us or speaking to us, we were going to see them at their place of work. Because don't forget, many of them were working 13 hour shifts, long days. Uh, so taking the clinicians to, to that point was obviously very important for accessibility. And then there were the usual WhatsApp and email ad hoc introductions and, and also the development of virtual patch testing as well as some limited face-to-face -face testing, which will Louise will talk about shortly. So that all happened in the, in, in, in the space of that week. We got all this uh, on board and starting waiting for the problems to, to, uh, to, to develop. Now, as far as hygiene is concerned, and particularly hand hygiene, what we told staff uh, was that all hygiene methods appropriate for the present COVID-19 situation. So this is not social cleansiness of the hands. This had to be uh, removing the virus, have the potential to cause irritant contact dermatitis. So in the handout we gave them, that was the first statement, warning them there is a risk and we appreciate that that is the risk. And that obviously repeated exposure to soaps, hand uh, sanitizers and detergents, etc. Uh, have the potential to damage the skin, but the aim of the intervention is to mitigate the tendency to this. There was all, we, could, we could not eliminate it completely, but what you need to do is try and uh, reduce, mitigate the risk as required under the COSH 
uh, regulations. And what was not immediately obvious, uh, at least to uh, uh, in, in various sectors, is that you know you don't need the soap and water uh, to clean your hands. And in a in a in a uh, in the ordinary uh, clinic, it, it just ordinary clean hands, the alcohol gel sanitizers sanitizers are equally acceptable and that was the point that was often forgotten and i might say that all the advice that we ever gave and still give are always checked with the director for infection infection control to make sure we're not saying anything that uh, that we that we shouldn't and the other thing that we advised the staff about was that uh, when they're using the alcohol-based sanitizers, the gels may be less irritating than sanitizer foams. The foams contain a surfactant, and surfactants tend to be irritating to the skin. Uh, we also advise them that emollient hand cleansers, which you know I certainly use during the winter months, are not protective against COVID-19. So you couldn't have your, uh, your favourite moisturiser. Your hands may be socially clean, but not virucidally. No, no good as a, as a viricide. And the third point there is that uh, benzyl conium uh, chloride containing products are very popular in some uh, uh, skincare products uh, and moisturizers. Uh, we don't like them in our clinic because benzyl conium is a cationic surfactant and cationic surfactants have the potential cause an irritant contact dermatitis. If you're just using them intermittently, fine, but if you're using them repeatedly a dozen 50 times a day you get all that repeated irritant insult to to to, to, to the skin and you can develop an irritant reaction uh, to it so we we advise patients again against using benzalconium chloride products which are also used in many of the wet wipes which felicity will talk about uh, shortly and the other thing was that we, we told our patients in, in the material that we gave them, uh, the staff, should their skin on the hands become inflamed or they have facial irritation from the mass, basically contact us via the web link. That's a false web link, uh, I might say, don't try it. But we, we, this is what we did. We gave them immediate access to our services as well as immediate ac access to the outreach to the pop-up clinics on the, on the wards. Um, this is an indicative list of the preparations that our pharmacy gave us. Uh, uh, we, we devised it ourselves, but our pharmacy had lots of these, so we could have you know, a good stockpile here. Dactacor cream for, for the face, some Umivate, Elecon, Dermavate, Fusibet, and then a variety of moisturizers. And th the moisturizers were chosen here. They may not be necessarily my favorites. We all have our favorites and we all know the best moisturizer is that which feels nicest on the individual skin. But we had lots of them. We had lots of them in bulk and also in sample form for people to keep in their pockets. We also had gloves uh, and so on to, 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 for, for, um, for, 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 for distribution. Oops, I'm sorry. And just finally, before, before we go on, most of that, of course, is related to the hand uh, eczema uh, issue. And there was no direct advice I, I, I can see from the NHS or governments, apart from washing your hands for, for, uh, uh, for 20 seconds. But on the, on the 9th of March, so again, that's a few days after we, we, we promoted our uh, intervention, uh, NHS England and NHS, NHS Improvement uh, produced this advice for the for the uh, for for the masks uh, and it, it says it is recommended that you keep your skin clean and well hydrated apply creams at least 30 minutes before using your PPE but of course they don't actually say what creams to use because there are creams and there are creams and some products may cause problems from the point of view of the uh, uh, the protection that the FFP3 uh, provides. And again, Felicity will talk about that shortly. And the other thing that that memo says is it's important that you take the regular breaks we recommend every two hours to relieve pressure from the masks. And this is a problem. This is a problem which is very clearly stated there. We recommend every two hours, but we'll see from, uh, uh, from Felicity's talk that that was very, rarely actually uh, 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 achieved and that is a is a cause of concern. Now with that introduction uh, uh, I'm now going to pass over to uh, my colleague John McFadden who's going to talk about 
uh, hand eczema and the issues that we've been having here with our staff. Thank you. My name is John McFadden. I'm very pleased to meet you. And um, I want to actually first thank uh, some people because uh, at some stages we were getting a bit overwhelmed in the pop-up clinic and uh, all the dermatology trainees and consultants who had been seconded willingly came to help us out. So uh, thanks ever so much. And I think Felicity will talk a bit more about that. I'd like to talk about uh, our hand dermatitis patients. I mentioned those. Next slide, please. Um, there, there were 53, but there may be more. We're still collating data. Uh, one thing I've noticed is, is that actually facial dermatitis was a more common uh, uh, problem, but we still saw a lot of uh, hand dermatitis. Next slide, please. Um, now, most of the cases we saw were irritant contact dermatitis, and, and this is not uh, surprising given the frequent repetitive use of sanitary gels and, and washing of hands. Next slide, please. As Ian mentioned, we uh, uh, prepared a handout, uh, which he showed. I'd, I'd like to just highlight a couple of things. Firstly, the dry skin was very helpful and useful early sign uh, of, of progression of, of, of irritant dermatitis. Um, next slide, please. And it was a useful point to emphasize about the drying of the hands after washing before actually wearing the gloves. Next slide, please. And uh, we didn't, the staff didn't need any invitation to use moisturizers. They were all desperate for moisturizers. And actually some of the, my colleagues in other London hospitals were telling me the same thing. There was a, a, a big demand for moisturizers. So well done to the hospital for uh, having free access via us to, to, to large doses, uh, large uh, 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 amounts of, of moisturizer. Next slide, please. And as Ian mentions, our approach was to encourage whatever moisturizer they felt most comfortable on their skin. And, and we did have a, a variety of moisturizers for them to use. Okay, next slide, please. This is the hospital sanitizer solution made up by the pharmacy at GSTT. You can see the ethanol is over 70%, glycerol to help with the moisturizing, and also a, a small amount of, of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and that was uh, widely available and widely used. Next slide, please. There were other agents for, for cleaning, which we, we'll come on to. Uh, the last bit on, on the handout, uh, and it was very important, was the emphasis on resting the hands away from clinical work. Very uh, important point, which we, we regularly emphasized. Next slide, please. So most of our cases were irritant, and it mostly in our cohort, mostly have affected the backs of the hands, the dorsal interstitial spaces, the knuckles and digits, with dryness and then erythema, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, post-inflammatory or, or hyperpigmentation. Uh, edema and vesiculation were less uh, commonly observed. Next slide, please. And most of our treatments are highlighted in red. Uh, we we uh, using emollients now. Topical steroids. We're very keen to get inflammation down. Hygiene methods, and again resting uh, hands away from work. And you can see they're not used. The hand UV phototherapy that is currently changing uh, our, our phototherapy unit, uh, which is one of the best in in, in the country. Uh, as starting opening up for business as usual and we've talked to them and we're making use of, of their hand UV 
uh, uh, facilities now. Next slide. So in our cohort, the uh, risk factors that really stood out were a past history of atopic dermatitis, long hours of work, and uh, being unable to rest hands away from work, whether it's childcare or some other uh, uh, duties at home. Next slide, please. Now, we were able to patch test some patients. We had uh, restricted uh, uh, facilities, but we were able to do it. And we, particularly those uh, we, we, uh, who had, say, accentuation of, of dermatitis in the wrist area or secondary spread. And I'll just go through some of these. This is a 33-year-old nurse with uh, hand dermatitis. She has a history of atopic dermatitis, developed irritant dermatitis, but also came up to the fragrance chemical limonene and uh, lanolin derivative, a Merkel, and therefore she, we, she had been using some uh, lanolin uh, containing agents and stop dose and also avoids the limonene and now, now a 32 year old male nurse who had hand and foot dermatitis so there was an endogenous element and he came up to the fragrance marker Maroxin Prairie and also again limonene so he avoided uh, fragrance products uh, 40 year old uh, technician hand dermatitis uh, there was a query positive to limonene, but uh, her hand soap did contain uh, limonene, so, so just to be sure she, she stopped that. And also a surgeon who uh, unusually had vesicular palmer hand eczema, and they came up to sodium metasup by sulfite. We're not sure of the relevance of that. Um, he also came up to cobalt uh, metal, and uh, whereas before you wouldn't make, pay too much attention about uh, intermittent handling of uh, uh, metal, we now know from research from Denmark that actually uh, uh, small time re repeated handling of, of metals may uh, be relevant if you're allergic to nickel or cobalt. Uh, next slide, please. So, this is uh, one of the uh, cleaning agents available in the hospital, Q10 foaming. And, and you can, I've, I've put an, a red asterisk on the well-known uh, contact allergens there. And you can see there's quite a lot of contact, uh, potential contact allergens there. I've, 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 I've pointed out DMDM hydantoin, which is formaldehyde releaser. And there was one patient who we knew was allergic to formaldehyde already had been exposing herself to this agent. And uh, down at the bottom, we've got Laminaria japonica. Laminaria japonica is a plant, uh, a sea tangle, a sort, sort of seaweed, sea, seaweed, which apparently is popular in some, uh, as a delicacy in some Far East countries, but it's a plant that contains uh, limonene. So uh, there we are. Next slide, please. Now, um, we didn't see uh, any cases of allergic glove dermatitis. And why is that? Well, um, there was hygiene methods. There was use of, uh, uh, the, we, we, don't, we didn't routinely use rubber gloves and nitrile gloves, but you know, you could be no to prevent. I, I, but I think actually, the main reason was that we weren't able to yet patch test everyone. Um, and, you know, growing up uh, uh, training at St. John's, you, you learn from people like Cronin, Rykoff, that uh, all occupational hand dermatitis should be patch tested. You can't uh, exclude contact dermatitis just by looking at, at the hands. And we managed to, to do about a quarter of our hand dermatitis. So I, I suspect we didn't see any uh, allergic glove dermatitis because we weren't able at the moment anyway to patch test all our patients. I just put up a slide there actually, it's, it's just a, a little teaching point. Uh, the diagram on the right is uh, drawn by someone called Wilson, who was a dermatologist in central Middlesex in 1960. 
published in the BMJ. And if you see some recent cases we have, we can, he was showing there the signs, the Palmer signs of uh, allergic dermatitis to glove. And you can see how accurately it reflects on, on, on this chap's Palmer signs who had a, a glove dermatitis. We're all used to the wrist accentuation and over the dorsum and, and knuckles, but um, the, there's a Palmer sign of uh, glove dermatitis. Next slide, please. So um, in summary, uh, similar to uh, papers from China, there's a high level of uh, irritant hand dermatitis. And we found in our cohort, long hours at work, inability to rest hands away from work, and history of atopic eczema. And as I said, it's similar to the papers coming out of China that uh, uh, we were seeing this too. So um, fine, I think uh, I would, uh, I think it's my job now to ask Felicity Ferguson to give a talk or to inform us now about the facial dermatitis we saw amongst our healthcare staff. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, right, so I'm planning on speaking for the next 15 to 20 minutes on the kind of problems we saw with the facial dermatoses and the kind of strategies that we employed to, to help our staff at Guy's and St. Thomas's. So, as Ian has already mentioned, um, when the pandemic was approaching, we sort of started to become aware that we might expect to see significant rates of occupational dermatoses to facial skin from the media mainly. Um, and there were reports of healthcare workers in China and in Italy uh, suffering really quite significantly from these FFP3 masks. And lo and behold, it happened here in the UK and uh, it really has reached national levels of awareness. Uh, for example, the National Portrait Gallery have launched a campaign to paint a picture of our country in 2020. And images such as these, oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, images such as these have gained recognition from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge uh, in response to this campaign. But really, this is quite unprecedented when it comes to physical irritancy and facial dermatoses. There's very little in the literature about this. And for example, this um, study performed several years ago now from St. John's shows that really the only significant occupational group to be affected were uh, fighter pilots who were required to wear rubber masks uh, while on flights. And they experience difficulties felt to be mainly due to sort of occlusion, heat and friction. Other healthcare workers you might think uh, that would have such problems would be pharmaceutical workers working in drug development uh, or uh, fit paint sprayers needing to protect themselves from paint particles. But that isn't really something that's come through in our clinic. And I know from discussion with our colleagues around the country, similarly, they haven't seen significant levels of this. This is all very new. So we've heard mention of some of the measures that we took to try to address these issues. And one of them were these outreach clinics that I was fortunate enough to be able to set up with the help of my fellow Lee Floyd consultants um, over at Guy's and St. Thomas's. And we ran these clinics based near to the intensive care units to make it easy for staff to drop in whilst they're on shift. And they ran weekly for a period of a couple of months. And we've now been able to stop them because the incidence has dropped. And I think we're hoping uh, that will remain the case and we're retrospectively registering on our electronic patient record to try to track the activity. Oh, sorry. And uh, these are some images of my wonderful fellow redeployed consultants and some of our registrars as well, who were really fantastically helpful um, and meant the whole thing could go ahead. And I have to extend my thanks as well to our pharmacy team who were great at providing us with stocks of emollients and active treatments uh, to be able to give it out then and there when we saw staff to make their lives a lot easier and avoid lengthy queues in our pharmacy, um, and of course, reduce their exposures to other um, staff in hospital. Right, so as John has mentioned, we're still in the process of pulling together our data. So this is very much incomplete, but I think it does reflect the trends of what we were seeing in the clinics. So this data covers uh, both the telephone clinics and the drop-in service. Um, and comprises 136 consultations and 124 uh, unique staff members. 
Overwhelmingly, we were seeing female staff members. And I think a lot of that could be explained by the breakdown of the staff groups that were most suffering with problems. And you can see here on the pie chart on the right, it was our nursing staff that were suffering the most. Another significant group uh, were our physios, the respiratory physios working in intensive care with the very sick COVID patients were also experiencing a lot of difficulties, uh, both with facial rashes and with their hands. Whether you were working where you normally worked or whether you were redeployed was not a predictor of whether or not you suffered problems. And I think that's a reflection of the more stringent hygiene methods and the personal protection in use by our staff. Looking specifically at the facial rashes, atopic history was not a predictor of whether or not staff had problems, uh, which I thought we found very interesting. And I think another point I'd like to make here is I've already shown you that the majority of those coming to our clinic were female, and that may well be because of the staff group, but something else to be borne in mind is that with the FFP3 masks, they've originally been developed to fit a male face, and um, so a female with a different bone structure could potentially have more problems. And you've seen this pie chart from John, but it's just to show the breakdown of body sight um, of staff members affected. And on the right, I've pulled out our facial dermatoses and the primary initial diagnosis. So this is slightly misleading because some, quite a few of our staff members actually came with more than one kind of rash. It was not uncommon to see uh, physical irritant effects in combination with occlusive acne, for example, or an element of seborrheic dermatitis in combination with pressure effects. But I've just listed here what was the main um, issue for the staff member. And you can see overwhelmingly the majority were presenting with physical um, irritancy effects. Ian's already shown you that NHS England very clearly recommend breaks every two hours when you're wearing the masks to allow skin recovery and reduce moisture buildup. But you can see nearly all of our staff are required to wear these masks for longer than that. So this implies the average maximum duration they might wear a mask whilst on a 13 hour shift. And some staff members are wearing them up to five or six hours in one hit before they're able to go on a break. Uh, and that was right at the peak of the outbreak. This is one example of one of the staff members that came to see us. And you can see here the severity of um, her, her problems. She's got erosions and uh, ulceration across her nasal bridge. She actually needed to take a few weeks off work um, to allow skin recovery before she could go back to intensive care. So what did we recommend? So we reinforced messages from NHS England about importance of regular breaks and general skin um, health measures such as remaining hydrated and trying to maintain a cool environment wherever possible. For prevention, we worked with our tissue viability colleagues and first line we suggested sil tape, which is a silicon based adhesive tape that you can cut to size and apply over the nasal bridge and the cheeks prior to donning the mask. It was down to individual staff members to check that the fit of the mask was still um, correct after using this. And it was an important message that came through from infection control that because this tape would partly protrude outside of the border of the mask, it should be considered contaminated. So when staff go off for a break, they must remove the sill tape and then replace it when they go back on shift. However, sill tape is really a preventer. If staff have got significant um, irritancy already, then um, the next line is Mepilex Border Light for us. So this again is a silicon-based dressing, provides some pressure distribution and some good cushioning over the nasal bridge. Similarly, this needs to be taken off at every break and replaced when they come back on shift. And then you've heard mention of some of the emollients we had available thanks to our um, pharmacy staff. Uh, we are also obtained lighter emollients that are more acceptable for use on the facial skin and don't leave such a greasy residue. So the two that we had access to were Aquamax and Aphroderm colloidal oat cream, but that was purely down to what we could order through pharmacy at the time. And of course there are lots of others available. Um, and then we would promote good skincare whilst at home and the use of a thicker emollient and so on. We treated any active dermatitis as indicated, and you can see there some of our choices. And then for those staff that failed Mepilex Border Light, we did have a small number that had success with um, hydrocolloid dressings, such as Duoderm Extra Thin. Um, I think particularly with Duoderm, but also with Mepilex, with the requirement to remove it at every break, um, the adhesive portion of the dressing can cause skin trauma in and of itself. So we did um, provide adhesive remover on ward stock lists to hopefully minimise that skin damage to staff. 
but it's not an ideal solution. Right, so I've talked about some of the physical effects of the masks, uh, but we did consider whether or not allergic contact dermatitis was a consideration. And there is some literature out there to support this. So this case report came from Spain. It was a staff member required to wear an FFP2 mask who developed uh, well demarcated erythema along lines where the elastic bands of the mask sat while she was on shift. And she underwent patch testing to samples of the mask and to um, rubber accelerators and was found to have contact allergy to carbon mix, thioran mix and various breakdown products within the mixes as well as the elastic bands themselves. This case report has recently come out of China. So this staff member developed a well demarcated erythematous, almost urticated rash across the nasal bridge and medial cheeks. She actually first presented to her local A&E and was uh, thought to have lupus. Uh, but on subsequent dermatology investigation, suspicions were raised of an allergy because um, the, mask, the rash corresponded to where the sponge sat from inside her mask. And she subsequently went on to have, sorry, it's been slow to load. Oh, there we go. Uh, she subsequently went on to have extensive patch testing and it was identified that her contact allergy was due to isocyanates thought to be contained in the sponge of the mask and they're listed there for you. What was our experience? So the numbers here appear higher than on my first slide where we only had a few staff who were, had reasonably high suspicion of allergic contact dermatitis at first presentation and that's because if staff members came back to see us with their problems not resolved we would then take them forward for patch testing. So interestingly, we didn't see any contact allergy to any of the samples of the various masks in use in the trust, uh, nor to any of the rubber accelerators or isocyanates. But we did find some contact allergies that could be of relevance in exacerbating things. So for example, the first case, this nurse, she was wearing a strengthening nail polish that contained tosylamide formaldehyde resin. Um, and given the distribution of her rash, which also involved the periorbital area, we did feel that was relevant and recommended avoidance. We did see quite a bit of fragrance contact allergy, well, three cases. So that could be contributing, particularly from sources outside of work. So avoidance has been recommended. Colophonium was felt to be of old relevance in that case. Same for both nickel and chromate. But the formaldehyde could be relevant because formaldehyde releases are present in the Q-Town hand soap on the wards and may have been present in the cosmetics around um, the staff members' homes. So we've recommended avoidance for that. And then another turn in the tail, as our uh, occupational clinics were tailing off, uh, we were starting to see fewer numbers. We then experienced a bit of a second wave and it seemed to be very much be associated with swapping from the disposable FFP3 masks to the reusable masks. And we did a bit of investigation and uh, the trust had recommended as a cleansing practice to clean the masks with Clonel universal wipes when staff were going off on their breaks. Uh, leave this to dry and then they could reapply the mask when they returned on shift. Um, and overnight they would go off and be centrally sterilized. Um, so these are the Clonel universal wipes that are actually widely found in our trust. And they are certainly initially very reassuring um, because Gamma Healthcare, um, which is the manufacturer, um, has um, demonstrated on their website that Clonel is effective against coronavirus by the appropriate EU directive. Additionally, they highlight that these wipes are skin friendly. Um, so again, reassuring for use on the skin. However, when you look at the safety data sheet, it clearly states this product is not intended for skin use and staff should wear PPE when using it. They offer some reassurance that uh, there's a high volume of water present in the formulations. There is a dilution effect that could protect against um, problems with the contents. But what is in the masks? So there are three key antimicrobials listed in the ingredient list uh, and they're shown here and I'm going to focus a bit more now on benzalkonium chloride uh, which is the one that we're most familiar with in dermatology. Uh, you can see here it can be present in concentrations up to 0.5%. So benzalkonium chloride is found in several of the emollients and soap substitutes that we use frequently in dermatology but it is well recognized to cause irritant problems particularly in um, occluded sites or flexural sites. And this uh, case report very nicely demonstrated the severity of the rash that can be elicited by benzalkonium chloride. Uh, this boy with atopic dermatitis was having 20 minute baths a day with Oilatin Plus, and this was the rash he developed. Oops, sorry. 
Um, and then we know from data that's out there that benzalkonium chloride is not volatile, so it persists on surfaces for up to four hours after application. Uh, and thirdly, this study was looking at factors that might um, indicate susceptibility to irritant contact dermatitis. And as part of that study, volunteers had occluded patch tests with varying concentrations of benzalkonium chloride for four hours at a time. And you can see that in the bar chart there. So at concentrations of 0.5%, actually very few staff members experienced problems. Uh, but you can see if concentration increases, you see increasing prevalence. And if we think about how these wipes are being used, um, they're being used three or four times a shift for every break period. Uh, we're having evaporation of the water, leaving higher concentrations each time of this non-volatile substance. So you can understand how this could lead to irritant contact dermatitis. And this is one such example. This staff nurse came to see us. She had some discomfort with the disposable masks, but no real significant issues until she swapped the reusable masks. And you can see an example of the eczematous rash that she developed. We did undertake extensive patch testing to see whether or not allergic contact dermatitis could be at play here. But actually all patch tests were negative at day four reading. So with that in mind, after consultation with our trust lead consultant in infection prevention and control, we recommended a change to the cleansing practice. So staff members are now advised to rinse the masks uh, with tap water after wiping with Quinell, um, and then they can dry the masks and reapply when they need to. And this lady changed to that practice and you can see that her dermatitis resolved. Are there other options? So we do have um, in small numbers uh, available this no contact face helmet. Uh, I think there are two at the moment per intensive care unit. Um, they're only available by application to your line manager if you are unable to tolerate of the half face FFP3 masks. Uh, but we do have them as an option and some of our staff have needed them. I understand that more are on order, but um, there are delays associated with that because of the pandemic. And then just before I finish, to touch on two of the other dermatoses that were reasonably prevalent within the clinic, occlusive acne. Predominantly this was mild um, and would generally require topical management in the first instance. We had a small number that needed oral treatment with limacycline in combination with a topical agent. And we had one staff member who has been referred into our general clinic for consideration of isotretinoin. And this was a nurse who had had a course of isotretinoin in her teenage years and had been clear of acne for five years, but within four weeks of using the FFP3 mask had developed a significant nodular cystic flare. Um, and then seborrheic dermatitis. Interestingly, uh, our staff seemed to have this not just on the facial skin, but they also experienced a flare over the scalp. Um, and we would uh, recommend active treatment where needed. So ketoconazole shampoo as a shampoo and as a face wash um, and Apticort cream. So to finish, we really are seeing unprecedented rates of occupationally related facial dermatoses. And for us, the primary problem has been this pressure mechanical irritant contact dermatitis secondary to the masks. So we think it's really important from the outset to promote really good skincare and highlight the need for timely breaks. So every two hours really should be a benchmark. Our first line has been silicon-based pressure relief, which we've had good results with, uh, but it doesn't work for all. I think this situation has highlighted how important it is to be wary of medical devices in our workplaces. There really is a lack of clarity in ingredient labeling and the potential for harm. Um, and just to highlight that there are no contact um, FFP3 um, helmets that might be an option uh, for those that can't tolerate the half face mask. Thank you. And I'll now hand over to Louise, my colleague, um, who's going to talk to us about virtual patch testing. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. For seven reasons, um, our department uh, decided to undertake what we termed virtual patch testing. In light of the pandemic, there was an urgent need to re significantly reduce the number of face-to-face -face clinical consultations. There was a redeployment of staff, both doctors and nurses, to other acute medical services, a reluctance on the behalf of patients to attend for hospital visits, uh, which we find is ongoing. Patch testing is considered a routine dermatological investigation, and there are logistical issues regarding uh, adherence to regulations for social distancing. So these are our ongoing uh, pandemic service provisions for patch testing. So we have the usual face-to-face -face where the patient attends for all three visits, and initially, this was mostly reserved for healthcare staff. 
semi-virtual where the patient attends on the first day for application of the patches by the nurses and then they take the patches off at home and take photos of their back on day zero, two and five. And then completely virtual patch testing where the patients don't attend the hospital at all. And this is our standard operating procedure uh, for completely virtual patch testing. So letters are triaged to determine possible suitability. The patient is then contacted to confirm suitability for virtual patch testing and offered virtual, semi-virtual or face-to-face -face, and advising them that face-to-face -face may be at a later stage. A pre-patch questionnaire is completed by the patient and emailed back to us. And we also ask them to forward photos of their uh, presenting rash. The questionnaire and the photos are then reviewed by the clinician who may or may not contact the patient for further clarification and information uh, before ordering uh, the specific series. These are, these are then prepared by the nurses and posted out to the patients along with an explanatory cover letter with instructions and a pictorial guide. A household member of the patient then takes the photographs for them uh, of their back pre and post applying the patches on day zero, then again on day two and on day five. The photographs are then analysed and interpreted by the clinician and then the patient is consulted uh, or telephoned for the post patch te test consultation and a letter dictated. This is a picture of two of our nurses preparing the patches uh, to be posted out and employing higher than usual hygiene standards. Uh, this is the pictorial guide um, that we devised in our department um, in liaison with our clinical photographer. Um, and uh, we do feel that uh, it's fairly detailed and clear with multiple images and instructions, uh, with particularly uh, in relation to uh, how to mark the patches and uh, apply the tape, because obviously this is particularly important for virtual. However, we do find the patients do come up with their own versions and deviate from this a bit. So I'm now going to discuss a few interesting illustrative cases um, uh, to highlight our clinical and practical experience of virtual patch testing to date. And these cases are for members of the public, although we did offer all three options to uh, healthcare staff also. So the first case was a 46-year-old gentleman who was referred with this acute vesicular rash of his uh, right wrist, which he attributed to wearing uh, wooden beads. He tried to remedy this rash himself by applying lemongrass oil on it, However, it became, uh, it appeared to exacerbate it and it became more vesicular bullous uh, with local extension. Thankfully, he had more success with potent topical steroids. So now I'm just going to show some of his pictures as examples. So this is a picture of his back uh, before applying the patches taken by his partner. Uh, we do advise patients to take the photographs in good light. Uh, but you can see here there is a bit of shadow. Uh, these pictures are, are uh, can be helpful if there are certain landmarks on the patient's back that can help with identifying where um, certain uh, positive reactions are or where uh, the patches have been applied, such as moles, etc. cetera. Uh, and these are pictures of his uh, patches applied the markers. You can see that he didn't really do any of the numbering, uh, but as there weren't too many patches, it's, uh, uh, it's still quite uh, interpretable. So this is his day two reading. Um, and uh, you can see there's clear inflammation um, on uh, uh, the side of the first patch, uh, column two, row four, corresponding to colophonium or resin. And then at the side of patch two, uh, column one, row five, uh, corresponding to the fragrance marker, Meroxylon Pereire. Again, this was his uh, uh, own version of uh, doing his close-ups uh, of his reactions by holding the uh, the discarded pat or the uh, patches. And uh, these are his day five readings. And you can see there's clear one plus reaction to colophonium and a clear two plus reaction uh, to Meroxylon Pereire uh, with vesicles. So as he had no prior history of um, dermatitis, uh, before this, and he gave no history of reacting to um, fragrances or adhesives or plasters, it's thought that he's sensitized through these mala beads. And the wood from these is typically derived from different sources, including coniferous wood. Allergy to these woods can be detected by cross reactions with colophonium. He appeared to have an exacerbation of his dermatitis by the lemongrass oil. Uh, and the possible clinical uh, re relevance of this in terms of his uh, patch testing positive reaction to Meroxylon Pereire is that Neurolidol is a con shared constituent of lemongrass oil and Meroxylon Pereire. 
other sources being citronella, jasmine, lavender, and neroli, cannabis, and tea tree oil. Other possibilities are, is that there was an unidentified uh, chemical in both lemongrass and Roxalon prairie, or perhaps there was a false negative patch testing uh, to the individual fragrances as they are volatile haptons, uh, which I'll discuss a bit more later. The next case was a 71 year old uh, lady uh, who was referred with this uh, florid uh, periocular um, dermatitis which also involved her cheeks and neck. And you can see that she also had some associated periorbital edema. And this is a global view of her final day uh, reading. Um, uh, she didn't, uh, or she had removed the, the numbers for the day five reading. Um, but we were able to identify with other photos that she submitted um, that the uh, top reaction there on her left upper back is fragrance mix two, uh, and then the stronger reactions are to limonene and to two concentrations of linalool. These are just uh, some closer views. You can see a particularly strong reaction uh, to linalool uh, with vesicles, which we don't often see. And her strong reactions to these fragrance can be explained by the fact that she had a love of essential oils and used all of those uh, here listed, whether in diffusers, in the bath, and she said she even added them to her Vino daily moisturizing cream and also carried lavender in a handbag for what she said, emergencies. Uh, so the top two lavender and marjoram contain uh, linalool, all those in yellow contain limonene, and the bottom three in green contain both. Interestingly, uh, uh, the only uh, fragrance product which she said she previously reacted to was a perfume called Poison. The third case is a 55 year old female uh, who was referred with inter an intermittent paritic dermatitis, which she said involved her hands, face, scalp, upper trunk and hips. She worked as a fitness trainer and she had a prior history of eczema and atopy. She herself thought her rash was exacerbated by shower gels, shampoos and clothing dyes. These are global views of her day two and day five reading. Uh, again, this lady didn't actually uh, submit close-up views, uh, but when analyzing on the, these on the computer, you do have the ability to zoom in and out. Uh, and we noted that on her day five reading, she looked like she had a very questionable uh, weak reaction uh, there at patch five, uh, column one, row one, corresponding uh, to the mix of the preservatives MCMI uh, and MI but did not have a positive reaction to uh, MI on its own. Uh, as MCMI and MI are known to be volatile haptons in that they um, easily vaporize and we normally prepare them along with uh, most of the fragrances uh, on the day of patch testing, um, we decided to repeat the reactions, especially as she'd given a history of possibly reacting to uh, wash off uh, cosmetic products uh, and we also repeated the dye again, uh, given her own clinical suspicion. Uh, as there are volatile haptons, and uh, based on previous experience with um, these volatile substances possibly lasting a little bit longer when applied to filter paper, uh, we applied them to filter paper before putting in the IQ chambers and posting them out to her. Uh, and she retested uh, these herself about two weeks later, applying them on her arm. And the first image here is of her uh, day two reading, then her day five and her day seven. Uh, and as you can see, she has a, a clear um, positive reaction to MCMI MI, as well as a clear one plus uh, to MI. And this lady did check all of her uh, personal products and her household cleaning agents, uh, checking for both allergens. And she very kindly assembled this photograph for us uh, to show us uh, uh, all the ones she thought contained both. So clear clinical relevance established here. Uh, the final case is that of a 38 year old gentleman uh, who was referred with an eczematous dermatitis that was predominantly evol uh, involving his feet and ankles uh, and was quite persistent here. He did note some improvements since lockdown um, in that he uh, was no longer wearing leather shoes and perspiring less and he felt this was uh, helping matters. Uh, so we decided to pass this to, to our extended uh, standard series, uh, individual fragrances, um, plants as he liked to garden uh, and dyes as he did wonder about uh, his socks exacerbating things. 
Uh, so just going to show you uh, some of his positive reactions, and these are the photos uh, that he submitted. Um, so linalool, um, the dye PPD, fragrance mix two, uh, fragrance citral and limonene, uh, parthenolide, fragrance mix one, disperse orange dye. Uh, so in total, he had positive reactions to the dyes PPD and dispersed orange dye, fragrance mix one and two, limonene, linalool, citral, the other fragrances, geraniol and parthenolite. So based on these photos uh, and uh, these reactions, we made some assumptions about him. He previously dyed his hair or facial hair black or brown and or he'd had a black beach henna tattoo at one time. He wore brightly colored socks. He'd previously worked as a cocktail waiter. Him or his partner liked the scent of lavender and he'd once been to India. And we were right on some accounts. His partner loved the smell of lavender. He did work as a cocktail waiter. And why did we uh, guess this? Because often when we see citral, geranial and limonene come up together, all which are derived from citrus peel, we think of people who chop a lot of lemons and limes. He had indeed been uh, to India uh, where parthenium uh, is found wildly and is a recognized cause of, a, of airborne allergic contact dermatitis. However, we were wrong about him dyeing his hair dark. He had in fact dyed it orange when celebrating Dutch National Day with his partner. And he did wear brightly colored orange socks. So when we reflected on things, uh, we looked again and noted that the reaction to dispersed orange dye was actually stronger than the reaction to PPD. So normally what we see is that uh, dispersed orange dye uh, cross reacts with PPD and you get a milder reaction. Whereas in this case, it was the PPD that was cross reacting with the orange dye because he had dyed his hair orange. Uh, so finally, I'm just gonna discuss some challenges and considerations based on our experience today with uh, uh, virtual and semi-virtual patch testing. Uh, so, uh, you can't perform a skin examination at the initial consultation and in our contact dermatitis clinic uh, we do uh, try and do a thorough head and neck and hand skin examination in particular. Uh, perhaps introducing video consultation at the pre-patch consultation uh, may be of some help with this. Um, it, there are some difficulties with analysing reactions and in particular when it comes to weak positive versus irritant versus doubtful. Uh, and also on occasion with accurately determining the location of the reaction and the uh, corresponding allergen. Again, when you're trying to differentiate between weak positives and irritants, it's very, it's very helpful if you can palpate the reactions. Um, as I discussed, there are issues with volatile haptins uh, and if they um, vaporize, is there potential for missed allergies? Uh, we're going to investigate further and, and are doing so at the moment about whether the use of filter papers is actually a benefit uh, by, sending, uh, the, um, by sending some of the uh, volatile haptens both on filter paper and without uh, to the patients. Um, and also in our clinical experience, we have had positive reactions to fragrances with other volatile haptens so, uh, so far. Uh, so this may be not having quite the impact that we uh, might have expected. Uh, Normally in our, in our clinics, uh, the day two reading is, uh, we often add on additional uh, series or uh, were uh, clinically relevant, uh, and we may repeat certain allergens um, if they are uh, doubtful or known to be irritant um, uh, on day two to see if they're reproducible, and if they're true allergic reactions when we review again on day five, or we might, uh, if, if two, um, uh, uh, if two reactions are coming up uh, close together, we might repeat them uh, and separate them to see which one or both are the true allergic reactions. Uh, there are some patient factors to take into consideration in terms of suitability, uh, whether the patients have the ability or um, social circumstances um, and have a household member uh, who can assist them and take the photographs? Do they have adequate pho uh, photographic means? Um, uh, there can be some problems around, uh, revolving around accurate following of instructions. And um, I just put this picture up here uh, where the patient decided to put the, the final patches on horizontally down at the, the bottom of the back there. Um, 
Uh, there can be delays uh, with patients sending back the questionnaires and photographs. In terms of patient satisfaction, the overall feedback uh, has actually been quite good and um, patients are often quite happy to opt for the virtual uh, patch testing, especially at the moment when people still are uh, quite reticent about uh, traveling in and out uh, to central uh, London uh, locations and to attend hospitals. Um, it, there is difficulties as well with testing patients' own products, which we do very regularly, uh, as we can't prepare them in advance. Um, but to get around this, we do um, advise patients that they can carry out repeat open application testing of their own products subsequent uh, to patch testing, supplying so it two to three times a day at the uh, anti-cubital fossa and uh, checking for reactions a um, uh, uh, week to two weeks later. Um, there is a significant amount of uh, uh, administration time uh, to do this, so it's a, you need to have appropriate clinical time allocation for both doctors and nurses. There's a certain reliance on the postal system. We have had some issues with how files are returned, for example, SIP files being blocked by hospital security. Uh, in terms of our nursing feedback, um, it's generally been quite positive in that they find that it's easy to do and prepare when it comes to the um, the patches and posting them out. Um, they like the fact that the standard operating uh, procedure can change to cater for the patient. It's interesting for them to see the outcomes and view the results, um, but they do uh, also state that there is increased admin work for them as well as contacting patients and uh, chasing results. So in summary, these are uh, the patch testing uh, services that we are offering. Um, the consensus in our department is that face-to-face -face is um, still our first preference and uh, is superior. Uh, then would be semi-virtual and finally virtual. However, we, we do find that semi-virtual and virtual are good interim options and we think uh, better than a complete suspension of the service. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. That was a fantastic... Um fantastic collection of thoughts, ideas, and also your experience of what, uh, what you've managed to do in a, in a time when it's been really very difficult to maintain a, maintain a, a service that resembles the, uh, the service that we're used to. So I'm sure we've all taken a lot of, um, a lot of messages through, uh, through to our practice from that. Um, now, uh, I think we need to invite all the, all the speakers back, uh, back for some panel questions. So um, if Ian, John, Felicity and Louise could reappear, uh, we do have some questions and comments and... Yeah, um, I think I've got a little presentation to give, a little oh, summary sorry. here. Go, go. I think, uh, we, I think we will finish by four o'clock. We will, we will. Uh, I'll turn off then. Okay, thank you. I think... Uh, 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 our chairman, the president, was just. Uh, I'll just be. I'll just be very quick uh, here, if I could. Um, just a little uh, uh, summary here with with uh, with the discussion. Um, I think what's been what's been very clear is, of course, is that uh, our, our frontline patients, as with all people working in the healthcare setting, are, are being exposed to all sorts of uh, agents. Um, that the hand cleansers were mentioned. Uh, John showed some photographs. Now, I don't know what the practice is in your hospitals, but in our hospitals, these dispensers are by every sink, uh, and you're obliged to put in the one litre cartridges there and you wash your hands. But, uh, you know, our, we don't know what we're using. Our patients. Uh, the, the staff don't know what they're using. We showed the example, we had, uh, John mentioned the example of the, the nurse known to be allergic to formaldehyde with hand eczema, and yet she was washing her hands with the products in this dispenser. Um, the company has two products, one containing DMDM high dantoin, which is a formaldehyde releaser, and the other one, diazolinyl urea, which is a formaldehyde releaser, and she didn't know. And that had a negative effect on a hand eczema. Now these are cosmetic products, so there has to be ingredient labeling. The ingredient labeling was certainly on the, uh, in the cartridge, but the, the, the cartridge is inserted into this 
into this device, which you need a key to unlock. So she wasn't aware. And that's the problem. And Felicity mentioned these products, these universal wipes, which are by every sink, every desk in our hospital. And it may very well be the case in yours as well. This is uh, just from a, a download that I took last night. Uh, it says skin friendly, or I think it now says patented formula rather than that. It's got the CE mark, which means it's a medical device. And it says dermatologically tested to be friendly to skin and does not cause dry or sore hands. And yet the material safety data sheet dated last April says not intended for skin use. Use PPE because it contains these cationic surfactants, which are well known to be able to cause irritant contact dermatitis with appropriate exposures. And compare it with this, and I've put confused, because I'm totally confused. And here we have the wipes again, with somebody wearing gloves, the most effective universal formula, it's a formula on the market, dermatologically tested, classified as a medical device. There's been some slight modification in the formula because these cationic surfactants may now be at slightly higher, higher concentration. It's dated March this year and is intended for skin use. Now, I actually think these material safety data sheets must be wrong. I really think that they must be wrong. But one of the problems here is there is no ing effective ingredient labeling on these products because they're medical devices. And furthermore, the material safety data sheets produces a, a disclaimer. We assume no legal responsibility for use or reliance upon this information. OK. And here we have an issue because these products, unlike cosmetics, are medical devices, which and under, under the new regulations, this is supposed to provide better protection for public health and patients safely. But the current regulation does not offer any benefit for the prevention and management of adverse events, such as irritant and allergic contact dermatitis, because there is no meaningful ingredient labeling. And this applies to these sorts of products, these wipes. It applies also to examination and the sterile gloves. And in another sphere, of course, the, 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 the glucose monitors uh, 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 and the insulin pumps that the diabetic, diabetics use, they're all medical devices. There is no meaningful information on composition. And compare that with foodstuffs, medicinal products and cosmetics where there is full ingredient labeling. And we, I really don't know how in the medical devices regulation they've got away with this. It really does need to be uh, uh, corrected. And we have another issue as well, is some of these products like the alcohol gels uh, are not cosmetics, uh, they're not medical devices, they come under the biocidal products regulation. So that's another regulation. And uh, on this example here, it says hygiene biocidal, uh, uh, biocidal product. It just says active substance, alcohol. And yesterday I asked the company, what's, what's in that's 80%, what's the other 20%? and they provided the material safety data sheet that just disclosed ethanol. And I said, well, what are the other ingredients? And uh, anyway, eventually they sent me a list. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it's remarkable uh, that, we, we not, that these sort of products do not provide all the necessary uh, information that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's required. So in summary, and I'll be very quick here now, um, we've had the three presentations giving three different facets of the problem that we've been seeing in our, in our patients. Uh, but I hope that we were proactive in, in preventing and treatment of, 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 uh, of our uh, staff because it, it was predictable uh, and it was anticipated they will, would develop problems and they did develop problems and I hope that we were, we, we were able to do what we could to, uh, to reduce the severity, extent and duration uh, of the problem and reduce the number of people who are affected. And we're reminded that although we, we work in hospitals and patients are our uh, primary responsibility, as employees, our employer's responsibility is to us. And there's an overriding requirement under, under health and safety regulations that our health and safety should be looked after. And within this, the CE mark for medical devices does not provide 
confidence regarding skin safety full stop and i'd love to discuss this we also we also there was some information on uh, the wearing of the mask don't wear for more than two hours and so i could find no similar information from the point of view of hand cleansing apart from washing your hands for the 20 20 minutes i think centrally the nhs must demonstrate that there's been competent uh, assessment uh, of the safety of medical devices and similar from the point of view of skin uh, safety because only once you you can do that can you start introducing effective risk uh, management thank you i'll stop there thank you very much that that's actually brought up some of the some of the thoughts for the future i think ian just thinking about um, how we're going to be seeing lots of people doing not just healthcare workers People, uh, people out there buying up lots of hand sanitizer, using it a lot, etc., etc. You can't go into a shop, of course, now without applying it. You can't come into a hospital. Um, the use of alcohol gels is has skyrocketed, hasn't it? Uh, as well as all sorts of different masks. Yeah. So um, uh, there are there are a, a number of questions, and um, I think there are a couple of very important ones perhaps to start off with, if you don't mind to ask the panel. So um, we, we know that if, uh, if somebody's a hairdresser or if somebody wants to be a hairdresser and they're an atopic individual, we usually would offer words of advice. Uh, but of course, people um, are going to be using these products. What, um, what advice would you give to atopic individuals with regard to skin protection, uh, skin cleansing, whether they're healthcare healthcare workers or even just um, just members of the public? Felicity. Um, right, uh, so for um, the facial rashes, the interesting thing was that it affected um, atopic and non-atopic individuals. So the same skin care advice was given to all staff from that perspective. Uh, with the hand dermatitis, it's very much been, we've had to reinforce that they need to use appropriate hand sanitizers and hand soaps and they can't use the soap substitutes when cleansing for coronavirus, uh, but that when they're in the safe space of their own home, away from um, the healthcare setting uh, or the wider environment, so potentially would be considered to be coronavirus risk-free, they can give their hands a holiday and wa uh, wash their hands with soap substitutes. Uh, any emollient uh, that they prefer would be one that we would recommend. Um, and then it's general emollient advice, pat your hands dry, uh, don't rub them. Uh, apply emollient after every hand washing episode, so a lighter one for day-to-day -day use and then perhaps a greasy one if they can tolerate it uh, with cotton glove occlusion overnight. And I think we've been very um, keen to promote that the first sign of skin breakdown for hand dermatitis, it's, that's where it's very important to get in with a topical steroid er early to minimise uh, future breakdown and deterioration. Is there anything else you would add, um, John? No, only the emphasis about uh, resting your hands away from work. I think that's very, very important. I wonder if we'll see a, uh, a rise in hand dermatitis amongst the public as they start to uh, become a bit obsessed about washing their hands and putting putting hand gel on. Something for the future. Yeah. Um, Ian, any... Well, a lot of the hand gel, a lot of the, 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 the products you can buy now contain a little bit of glycerine, a lot of the alcohol-based gels. It's glycerine. Of course, glycerine is the humectant. Um, the foaming alcohol ones don't contain the well, at least the ones I've seen don't contain uh, the, 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 the glycerine, so they do have a drying effect. But the, the gels uh, do contain glycerine or, 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 or similar, so we think that at least my view is that they're less irritant. The other thing you may not know is uh, you know, as you come in and out of the hospital and the tube stations and everywhere else now, you know, we're, we're asked to. Uh, the sanitizers are all over the place. Um, you're supposed to rub them in, you know, three mLs um, uh, for 60 seconds for, for the proper virucidal effect. I'm not sure that's generally uh, well known. Um, most of us just put it on and it evaporates quite quickly and that's it. But you're supposed to repeat the application for a full at 60 seconds, which is three times longer than washing your hands for the, for the 20 seconds. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, so, some, there's some other questions here, obviously occupational health physicians, uh, are occupational health being uh, uh, notified? How are they being involved? Are they being reported, this is Mike Beck, to Epiderm, HSE, back to someone else? Are, are they being reported under, under RIDOR uh, and uh, uh, so on? 
And again, I'll ask Felicity and John there because they, they, they're developing the database for recording <laughs> of these. John. Um, they're not being reported to Ryder. We should be reporting them to um, uh, Epiderm and, and perhaps we should get on with that. Yeah. Yeah. Felicity. I would agree completely with John. And someone's asked here, uh, uh, do you think scarring from facial PPE could be permanent? Have you seen any scarring as such? They're getting an irritant dermatitis and some superficial erosions, but the, uh, have you seen any scarring? Generally, we've seen um, staff sort of quite early in the outbreak. So I don't know if we've caught them at a stage before it's got that severe. So we've, yes, seen the superficial erosions and uh, some of them have been significant, but not to a degree that would cause scarring. We have had some staff that are troubled sort of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. We've had to counsel them about that and that will take some time to settle. Uh, but we haven't in our cohort had any scarring. Okay. I think uh, one of my, one of our colleagues has mentioned it, but I, I can't remember who now. But so uh, it may have been seen. It's possible. Yeah. 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 Uh, Helene Menage, an ex-president of the RSM, has asked, you know, any issues with the sill tape uh, other than removing and how does it differ from other silicone gels? I think we use the sill tape because our, our tissue viability people uh, liked it, I think, I think, and including the patients with EB uh, and so if I'm uh, uh, correct, and we, we certainly had a, 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 a goodly supply uh, of it. Uh, and the Mephifix um, light as well. Uh, but uh, Felicity, because um, and people have tried a number of these products. Yeah, no, our tissue viability team are big fans of Sil Tape, but it is quite thin. It doesn't provide a lot of cushioning. So it's more for prevention if staff feel they're getting pressure from the mask. So they've already got um, anything approaching skin breakdown. It doesn't really do a good enough job that we found in our experience. Um, so yes, that would be, so I think it's just that partly it's pragmatic where you know it um, and we have it widely available in the trust. Yeah, and with the nasal, with the nasal erosions, uh, Mabs Chowdhury has asked here, um, what, what about uh, follow-up? How, how long does this take to uh, settle and do they have to continue protection and so on? Mm -hmm. Uh, for the majority um, who are starting to get problems, having their sort of two or three uh, days off Seem to be enough to allow them to recover enough to return to work but I think we've certainly had at least two staff that we've had to recommend they take at least two weeks off work to allow their erosions to heal uh, before they can then go back on shift. Yeah. Um, so small numbers but it has been happening. Um, I'd also like to share while I'm speaking at the moment actually a top tip that's come through from King's and Sarah Walsh because I wasn't aware of this and I think it's a really good suggestion. They're using skin safe silicon wipes as a preventative intervention so this can be a wipe that's put over the clean skin at the beginning of the shift, which leaves a thin film of silicon, uh, and that seems to not interfere with the fit of the mask. And although they're in the process of analysing it, anecdotally, it seems to be helping. So I think we will also look into that as well as yeah. an option. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another question is concerning uh, our involvement with uh, occupational health. Uh, these are skin problems that we've been uh, seeing and we're dermatologists and we do occupational uh, dermatology. We have been liaising with our occupational health uh, 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 service. We, we have uh, regular uh, correspondence and uh, it's, not a, it's not a duplication of uh, uh, services, it's, it's, it's different. Uh, we, we, were, we were not able to do our usual work that we would be doing during the course of the week. Uh, so, in fact, developing what we've done is, in fact, our, our way of being redeployed and doing something useful. Uh, and the patients were our staff rather than the, you know, our, our, our regular um, uh, 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 patients. And I think that's that's perfectly fine. Someone's also asked about loss of in, uh, fingerprints uh, from, from, from all this passport controls. In fact, I've got exactly the same problem. My computer can't open. It's locked because the, the fingerprint on my fingers has, has, has disappeared. Uh, that's because of dryness and so on. Uh, that will recover in, in, in due course. And I think uh, if I'm not... Yes, I'm going to ask one more question about, um, about the face masks. You mentioned the PPE masks fitting male faces better than female faces. Um, I just wondered of your face mask reactions, 
whether you had any males amongst them, and if so, did they get the trouble in the same distribution as the females? Um, so we did see a couple of men come through with face mask dermatitis. It was overwhelmingly female, and yes, that may reflect the staff group. Um, our nursing staff are predominantly female here at Guy's and St Thomas's. Um, but the men that seemed, we had, I had definitely, it was similar actually. I think the small number, but we had some which were, you know, circumferential cheeks and nasal bridge, and others that were just the nasal bridge. And that did seem to be uh, the men with prouder noses, if that helps. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to, to ask um, one last question, uh, or make a comment really. Uh, there's a question about contact allergies to the dyes in the homemade face masks. Reminded me of your man with the orange socks. Um, of course, just like, just like the public using much more in the way of skin cleansers, we're going to see all sorts of fashion masks as well as homemade masks coming through. Maybe too early to, to see if you've had any um, uh, clothing dye reactions. I, I haven't seen it, but it's possible, and, and, and we may see it. Yeah. We'll await the first case. Well, we, 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 we have another ex-president of the section who's busy, busily making these at home at the moment, so we shall ask Dr. Professor Malario in due course what, what risk assessment she's done. Okay, and um, I think we should finish on that. We'll, we'll think to the future. Um, just to to say thank you to all our presenters from today. You've given us a wonderful, um, wonderful all-round view of the sort of problems you've been seeing recently, but of course the problems we're probably going to continue to see for the next little while because face masks and protection are not going to go away soon, are they? So I think, uh, so I think some of your tips will be able to be carried on to all of us across the country. Thank you very much. Um, you will be sent uh, some feedback requests you will be able to access the um, you will be able to access the video in in a day's time uh, you will be able to have access to viewing the sponsorship products from today and i hope that you'll be able to enjoy coming to uh, the dermatology section webinars there isn't one in july but there is one in august and then every month thereafter for the next academic year so we look forward to welcoming you welcoming you back uh, to the next uh, presentation in August, which is on skin pollution and, uh, sorry, air pollution and skin health. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us.